Welcome everyone. I'm going to be live once more in preparation for the seminar on Baudrillard this weekend, 22nd and 23rd of April, Saturday and Sunday. We will meet from 5 to 8 p.m. UK time, which I think is 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'm going to read a bit of Baudrillard and I'm also going to describe what the seminar will be like. Now, as you can see, the thumbnail says Baudrillard and Mythopoesis. In Simulacra and Simulation, which is the main text that we'll be discussing on Saturday and Sunday, um, which is uh, just to make this clear, the uh, seminar is not public. So this will not be on YouTube or anywhere. You have to enroll via uh, the link in the description of uh, this video. And once you've done that, you get access to two videos of mine on Botria that are not on YouTube and not anywhere else. And also access, of course, to the seminar that I'll lead this Saturday and Sunday. So just so there's no confusion. And now the title, as I said, is Botria and Mythopoesis. There's something a really a peculiar chapter in Simulacra and Simulation, which is entitled History, a Retro Scenario, where Baudrillard says the following, histories are lost referential, that is to say, are myth. Now, of course, it's the question, what does he mean by myth? Does it just mean what we usually mean? It is a, you know, the vernacular, is it, it's a lie or sort of a, a noble lie that we tell ourselves in order to make sense of the world. Or is there something more profound going on? Let's say myth in the old sense of the word of mythos. He does, he is, I mean, Baudrillard does think that we have lost access to, to history insofar as a revolution is no longer possible. So here he's, I think, uh, fully on board with, with Marxism understanding history as just the possibility and necessity of revolution. But, and he also, he just says that, um, for example, history is becoming uh, sort of a hyper semblance. And I think here we can say something, tie this back to, 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 to myth itself, to human myths. Um, th th there's something strange, something really strange about our time which mechanizes everything, which can make seemingly absolutely everything operational including myth. And that's one of the things that we'll discuss on Saturday and Sunday. So he gives the example here um, on, on Kubrick, actually. Let me find a quote. Sorry, just a second. So he says on Stanley Kubrick, the director, Kubrick manipulates his film like a chess player. He makes an operational scenario of history. And something quite similar has been the case with Star Wars, or actually with Joseph Campbell. So Joseph Campbell, as you may know, was a consultant on the first Star Wars episodes, the original, which is now 456, uh, with uh, Han Solo and Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia. He was a consultant to George Lucas. I don't know to what extent they, they were acquainted beyond that, uh, but I think Campbell's uh, writings uh, influenced George Lucas quite a bit. And Joseph Campbell is usually wrote books 
with titles such as the Myths of Humanity, etc., all going more or less in the direction of uh, perennialism, which means to say that ultimately all the old myths say the same, everyone believes the same, which is not true. But Kempel did something else. And when you find, um, when you look at, you know, there's obviously there's tons of videos by him because he was, he was the Joseph Kempel Foundation is a pretty serious media enterprise. Uh, you, what's striking about Kempel is how ex just utterly operational he makes myth. So he breaks it, he breaks myths down, I'm not going to go into detail now, but he breaks myths down into their ways of functioning and looks at purely basically at the uh, psychology and the eff 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 effectivity of myth. And once you've identified, let's say, the patterns, so-called, in this weird, strange time in which everything has collapsed into a simulacrum, our time, you can make myth operational and mash it together, as is the case in Star Wars, which is ultimately a slightly confused um, amalgamation of Greek and Christian uh, themes. So we and, and Kubrick is here, his example is Barry Lyndon. Um, we could, of course, uh, also think of, I mean, there's a Baudrillard's example is Barry Lyndon, but we could also think of um, uh, uh, maybe 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is basically a, a metaphor of the history of the future. And so I'm going to read a bit more now in a second. If there are any questions, then on on the uh, seminar specifically then let me know we're meeting this weekend saturday and sunday from 5 to 8 p.m probably a bit longer so six plus hours in total this is not uh, on youtube or anywhere this is you have to enroll in the course which you can do here the link is in the chat and the link is also in the description of uh, this video so please do enroll every enrollment helps continuing the work here if you have questions um that are on the seminar just let me know um and to to make something operational is is like like myth is really bizarre uh don't think for a second that this is how uh, the Romans or Greeks thought of their myths as, as purely something that is functional. They are, to quote Karl Philipp Moritz, uh, who still had a bit of a stronger connection to genuine myth than someone like Joseph Campbell. They are the traces of the earliest history. They are, they, they, they are, they trace, they, they tie us to the earliest traces of of human existence. And I don't necessarily mean traces that you can find, right? Perhaps history more in the sense of Emerson, if you know this beautiful essay by Emerson. Now, I'll quote again from Baudrillard. History is a strong myth, perhaps along with the unconscious, the last great myth. And this is, you have to, you know, hand it to Baudrillard, how he just slips these uh, things in. Uh, that he says that the unconscious, which obviously is Freud, is the, is a myth. And you always wonder, what does he mean by myth? Um, is myth, again, is it just the vernacular sense of myth, sort of a, a lie, a story, a concocted narrative, or is there something more profound to it? But history is a myth, he continues, that at once subtended the possibility of an objective enchainment of events and causes and the possibility of a narrative and uh, sorry, and the possibility of a narrative enchainment of discourse. The age of history, if one can call it that, is also the age of the novel. It is this fabulous character, the mythical energy of an event or of narrative, 
that today seems to be increasingly lost. Behind a performative and demonstrative logic, the obsession with historical fidelity with a perfect rendering, this negative and implacable fidelity to the materiality of the past, to a particular scene of the past or of the present, to the restitution of an absolute simulacrum of the past or the present, which was substituted for all other value. We are all complicitous in this, and this is irreversible. So he's obviously here uh, talking more about um, cinema and how cinema treats off history. And he says that this sort of this, this attempt at realism in historical cinema is a, a clear sign of the simulacrum. But I also do think that when he says that history is our last great myth, that there could be a hint here um, at, at something else, it's sort of an over, a possibility of an overturning. Um, he, Baudrillard speaks um, here and there of reversibility and also of the, the sort of the, the necessary breaking point of the matrix or the simulacrum when it becomes too that's powerful or too pervasive. So I do think that uh, there's always a double sense in play here when he speaks about myth, really, um, that it always means both. It, it does seem mean that history is becoming sort of a lie to us. Uh, we have no more genuine connection to it. But at the same time, it also seems to imply that um, really the mythical, mythical elements could uh, come back. And in some sense, of course, they, they have in, 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 in cinema, uh, even, even though, of course, in this highly operational, uh, functional uh, manner, which plays on, let's say, the, the archetypes so, well, okay, here's a question uh, by Duke Valentino. The society of the spectacle is uh, Guy Debord. Uh, and there's a funny story here um, about Guy Debord. Um, so but just as a side note, Baudrillard does not think that there is any longer a society of the spectacle. He, he, he thinks that this is over uh, because the spectacle actually presupposes that there is an object, a, a clear sort of performance that there is a spectacle period uh, that is uh, observed by spectators. That there's a clear distinction between the two and that distinction has collapsed. I mean, so we, as soon as you have uh, re reality TV, so-called, which is in itself paradoxical, uh, there cannot be reality TV uh, because the TV camera interferes with uh, so-called reality and restructures it. Uh, w once that uh, happens, you, you have no more a spectacle. Um, you, so he actually, so he also thinks that there is no panopticon, for example. And Guy Debord, here's a, here's a, maybe a funny anecdote. In the 90s, I think, um, maybe, maybe some of you are familiar with uh, Silvio Berlusconi. He's a, an Italian uh, businessman, very successful, and also was a prime minister several times. He is also the owner of one of the biggest media empires of of italy and it must i think it was in 1990s or early 2000s when an italian um, journalist interviewed the current ceo of the media empire that was founded by berlusconi and the uh, interviewer asks him how did you get so successful and the uh, currency at CEO at the time which don't know the name of, I don't remember, uh, responded, well, we read Guy Debord, Society of the Spectacle. 
because Guy Debord thought in his Socratic foolishness that just educating the people uh, would lead to to a recognition of the spectacle, hence to the end of the spectacle. The exact opposite has happened. It's also striking that Charles Baudrillard is studied by brand managers, right? People who are brand people who are marketing people. They read Baudrillard. They read him, and he. So Baudrillard is now very important. Baudrillard studies for um, branding and strategizing the brand of countries and cities. As you, as you know, countries and cities are now brands and uh, have, have to sell themselves to the low-cost herds of tourists. So, um, yeah, I... So, <laughs> I don't know what that tells us about the... Uh, Simulacrum, that's something that we should uh, discuss on, uh, on Saturday and Sunday. So, well, so Max is asking, what does Baudrillard mean by the statement the Gulf War did not happen? What do you think of it? Well, Max, you have to enroll. Then you, then you learn. Um, this is one of the things, obviously, that we will be discussing. Um, Uh, as I said, this is the link to enroll. Um, but just briefly, what what he says um, is it the war the war is televised to a degree in real time televised that a genuine conflict here does not really come to the fore the, the, the conflict is sort of is, is collapsed in the real time of the of the televising uh, of the what we, we would today say of the live streaming of the event and something that is peculiar think about it um, I mean, these are provocations, obviously, right, by Baudrillard. But think about our time. You now have, everyone now has one of these things. And if anything happens, you can film and live stream what's going on. Depending in which camp people are, they will likely not believe if it is from the other team. Right? They will not see that. Or even if you film something, it's still perspectival. You're not filming everything. You cannot. I don't even think that we live in a perspectival age anymore because perspective requires clear vision. Uh, we've lost that. We live in a imploded hall of mirrors and crawl through the shards of what's left, but uh, yeah, so <laughs> it goes in, so that's the direction you have to uh, think here. And, but yeah, this is one of the things that we will be discussing. And so I implore all of you to enroll, just to explain this again, because now there's more people here. This weekend, Saturday and Sunday, we, I holding a weekend, intense weekend seminar where we will be reading Simulacra and Simulation, and we will be discussing films like Matrix, The Matrix, American Psycho, The Truman Show, and of course, also something like Natural Born Killers or Fight Club. One of the videos actually that's included with when you enroll is a video on Fight Club, which is uh, a sort of a Marx's critique of finance capitalism, which of course cannot get very far because it is stuck and remains stuck in materialism. When you click on the link, then you, this is the page that it takes you to. Uh, again, April 22nd to 23rd, 5 to 8 p.m. UK time, 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we'll meet over Zoom. 
as is appropriate for this. We will be discussing questions like what are examples of simulations or simulacra? How can we at all tell what they are? What is the role of movies? What is the role of capital? The move from use value to exchange value. Does Baudrillard offer a way out? I think there is something peculiar to that. So I think that there is something that he uh, offers in some sense, even though he seems to be hopeless himself, but he speaks of reversibility and he does also speak of uh, history as myth. And how does his theory relate to Plato's myth of the cave? Right, so, and if you're a student of any sort, you can enroll with a student discount. Just click on this link here. If you wanna, if you want to talk to me, just do this, or this is the weekend seminar. And every enrollment, as always, allows me to keep the lights on here. So, well, okay. So the question is: So the society has become the spectrum. There's nothing outside of it. No. Um, you, you, you're thinking of this still in terms of an, an objective reality. There is no more spectacle. Um, so the question is, so the society has become the spectacle and there's nothing outside of it. I, again, th that would mean you sit, you're, I'm sitting here, there's a spectacle, I'm watching the spectacle, the spectacle is over, I go home. I, I can analyze the spectacle, I can critique the spectacle. And it's not that the spectacle is not everything, it's now full-on fragmentation. That means there are no, there is no one who is not a spectator, uh, or rather, it, there's such a fragmentation that cannot be a spectacle in which everyone shares. So, uh, it's, it's a radical fragmentation, uh, full-on to the, let's say perspectival, and um, it's it, a spectacle. Also implies to a certain degree a artificiality or um you know at least that there's something that can be distinguished from um from what is now the spectacle and what is actually real but th th that's no longer uh, the case with in in it's, it's what we are talking about something else entirely we're talking about how computer simulations and models for example the calculations that are drawn up every day on the economy how they influence, interfere, make the world, make what we consider real. So the, the question, what if you are the spectacle? That, that's not, that's irrelevant, that question. Um, if you want to understand Baudrillard, the word spectacle no longer applies. There is no spectacle. What we're looking at is how hyper-reality is constructed through computer simulations and models and sim and hence how that generates simulacra. So there are future, can you think of anything? What is it that people, what that we're being, so can you think of anything where we hear a calculation about maybe when the world might end or what was it when oil runs out or the Arctic poles melt away, or this, that, and the other, those are computer simulations. Those make reality, so-called reality. They make hyper-reality. That is what's going on. I mean, do not think that, um, and by the way, this perfectly ties in with hyper-morality, right? Um, so the the uh, the thought here is what we, what we really want to get to hmm, this weekend is to understand in how far almost every aspect of our lives is driven by a simulation, is constructed by simulation. We are the children of hyper-reality, whether we like it or not. There are phenomena of LARPing, etc. Uh, and so, and here's some, here's some, so, so a Paul, I feel as though the notion of spectacle is still attached to the simplistic Marxist notion of ideology, which contrasts itself with science or a way out of, a way out of Plato's cave, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
And also that that implies manipulation. That that's the issue, right? It implies that there is, as uh, Edward Bernays says, another very important book that not enough people have read, Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. He wrote a book which is entitled Propaganda. So it's a real book. He worked, he, he was the one who marketed to women that they should smoke cigarettes because it would liberate them, just as a hint at the past 100 years, if you've never heard of that. Uh, did, did none of this happened by accident. There was genuine uh, 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 manipulation. Let's look at the first paragraph here. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Has everyone heard that? The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. He says democratic, he doesn't say dictatorship. And this is not just anyone, this is Edward Bernays, who worked for uh, Procter & Gamble, CBS, the American Tobacco Company, and General Electric. General Electric. I think he's also the, the guy who invented bacon as healthy. I think he was the one who who had doctors say uh, in ads that smoking is perfectly healthy. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. He's talking about America here. By the way, he's also a relation uh, of uh, one of those, either the former CEO or current CEO of Netflix, if you... Maybe you didn't know this, maybe now you know. We are governed, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Now, however, as much as he might deem himself to be the great propagandist, in a world that is completely on the influence of experts, this is uh, Mark Crispin Miller writing in the introduction, in a world under the influence of propaganda experts, how does a costly truth get out into the world as truth? And he continues that, of course, what happens is that those who are uh, to convince, you must be convinced yourselves. And hence also uh, that the, 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 sort of the, the manipulators are manipulated themselves. So Baudrillard is already a lot further down um, he, he's no longer operating within the, or thinking in terms of, of liberalism, right? of, of, rational, of rational consumers that make uh, rational choices along their uh, incentive uh, interest, uh, what's the incentive curve. Um, it, so, <clears throat> and at the same time, uh, I would um, so I would take Baudrillard here then seriously and 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 see that there is now you cannot have um, let's say manipulation. By the way, um, well at least you cannot have sort of uh, neutral manipulation. It stays outside, yeah, uh, the current. That stays as as Edward Bernays thinks that stays behind the the curtain. Now, in terms of uh, so Baudrillard, Max, I mean Max, you have to sign up, you know. Uh, so Max says, when I uh, read Baudrillard, I feel he does not have the depth that Heidegger does. Well, who does? How do you think Heidegger can help us think with Baudrillard? I think that Baudrillard thinks continues some of the work. Uh, by Heidegger, and uh, he has a completely different um, access to it, of course, because he comes, he does come ultimately from 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 Marxism and uh, post-structuralism, and very rarely will so, uh, question some of those um, uh, uh, assumptions. But he he in his provocations, he can point us to something that perhaps is too painful to 
to see. But to 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 what we will do in the seminar is we will look at not just Heidegger and Plato, but also a little bit of Kant. Um, so we need to be a so because. <laughs> Uh, in some sense, already in Kant, you, what you get is the construction of objects without inherent contradiction in the phenomenal realm. So that through modeling and through sort of scientific models, etc., frameworks, we or well, the human mind concocts or transcendentally constructs a priori objects or an objectivity that has no resistance. Which is why some think that Kant is, is, a, is a proto capitalist or prophet of capitalism. Yeah, right. Okay, so Max, I need to see you on the weekend. These are very good questions. Uh, Dali, you're always here. I hope that you can make it to uh, the seminar. I promise you it won't be a spectacle. And also So Appalled, which is a very striking name. <laughs> I hope that you can enroll. Maybe you have already. I never know, of course, who you really are. Uh, the Sorry, um, the link to enroll again is here. And we, well, we must take these uh, provocations by uh, Baudrillard, I think, uh, very seriously. Also because, you know, as you know, he, he, he hated the Matrix films. Um, for for good reason uh, because they didn't go far enough they they didn't go far enough in in their appreciation of how far we have come in this interplay of simulation simulacra and the hyper real and we're not doing this as an exercise of you know learning 20th century continental philosophy no no the, we want to understand our time. He is a bit of a prophet or, or a historian of the future. So, and I mean, Jean Baudrillard, of course. And um, I mean, with Heidegger, we would have to go into language, Heidegger's understanding of language. And, but, oh, by the way, um, by, the, by the way, also, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt and others uh, are, are crucial here. So, I hope to... The new, I haven't seen the new Matrix film yet. I, overall, all Matrix films are obviously just uh, a techno version uh, of, of Neo-Christianity. Thomas Anderson, he, they could just talk, call him Christ. Um, and Neo. Right? So, uh, it's quite striking though that the one who wakes him up is actually called Morpheus. So, okay, let me know if there are more questions. I can stay around, stick around a couple more minutes. If there aren't any, then I implore you again, do sign up. There is a student discount. Or if you are doing any sort of um, training at the moment, vocational training, etc., just get the uh, student discount there on the page on the enrollment page, which is in the chat here, but which is also in the description of this video. And when I see you on Saturday and Sunday, come prepared, come prepared having read some Baudrillard. You don't need to have read the Simulacrum and Simulation. You can, have, you can read other texts. What we'll do is we will read Baudrillard together and I'll also send you off into breakout sessions to read with the others. And so you'll get to read Baudrillard and then we get to discuss him. And then we also, on the second day, we'll move further into um, uh, 
discussions of, of film and pop culture, etc., of, of brands and consumerism and all the usual uh, things that one discusses here, but at the same time, always with a view to some of the sort of uh, un unorthodox readings of Baudrillard. So I'm... I don't have a Marxist reading of this. I don't have a post-structuralist post reading of this. And um, I don't have a materialistic reading of Baudrillard either. I have a, as I said before, that there's a mythopoetic reading of Baudrillard also, where all of a sudden something, um, uh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, so the matrix is... Uh, uh, certainly a metaphor, yeah. But, you know, what, what does that tell you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so Paul just says, I think it's interesting that Baudrillard breaks with neo-Marxism later in his work because he sees materialism as insufficient. I think this happens when he published Symbolic Exchange and Death. Yeah, he, he further and further moves away from this. Um, and really further and further uh, realizes that material because material look, Marxism ultimately as you, you know, leads either to um, visions of collapse <clears throat> or to suicide uh, there's nothing else that it, it, it can give you you know all the just fantasies of or as you know just insane fantasies uh, in all, all of all kinds. So, anyways, yeah, I agree, so Paul. So I hope you enroll if you haven't yet. Um, and I hope to see you then on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. James will be there, that I know. Max, you have to be there, that I know. And yeah, I think there are no more questions. So link to enrolls in the description. I see you on Saturday. Thank you very much.